It's the year 1884. The American chess problemist and chess composer Joseph Ney Babson has just created one of the most legendary chess problems in history. And now that we have the, the year 2025, there is finally a solution to this chess problem. So it took more than 140 years to have a full solution, uh, which I find very much incredible, especially in the times of artificial intelligence, that it hasn't been solved uh, faster than that. Uh, but I was very much fascinated by this whole topic, and I have to put a big disclaimer. I stole this idea completely from uh, the newspaper Der Standard. It's an Austrian newspaper. I always read it on the weekend, and there is always a chess column in uh, in the week in the weekend edition of that newspaper. And we're going to talk about the article later as well. Um, but big shout out to to the authors who wrote an amazing piece and uh, who inspired me to to make this video. And I hope you guys enjoy. So what exactly is the Babson task? It's not that hard to understand, um, especially the Wikipedia article which we have in front of us delivers quite a nice explanation. Just one disclaimer, uh, how I understood it, there are a couple of interpretations for, uh, for the problem, um, also which is reflected by the number of attempts in different sort of solutions to the problem. But we're just gonna get go from here and I think then Everyone has kind of a sort of understanding on what we're talking about. So white has only one key or first move that forces checkmate in the stipulated number of moves. Black's defenses include the promotion of a certain pawn to any possible piece. So queen, rook, bishop, or knight. Um, and now comes the exciting part. If black promotes, then the only way for white to win the game, basically, um, is to promote to the same piece as did black on, on the move before. If you promote to another piece, then it's technically not allowed then to win the game. So then the requirements are not fulfilled to solve the problem. Um, the problem itself was composed, as I said in the intro, by Joseph Ney Babson, American uh, chess problemist, who came up with the problem in the year um, 1884, I believe. Uh, it's not exactly written here, but I think it was 18, yeah, 18, 1884, it's here. Uh, so absolutely incredible to come up with such a task uh, almost 100, uh, more than 140 years ago. Um, and now the question is who solved it and when did they solve it? So we're going to get into that now. It was, it has taken a lot of, lot of years to, to solve this. And I, I'm guessing it's one of the kind of legendary problems in, in math or chess that took such a long time to finally get solved. There are example examples from math as well, which I'm going to brief, briefly touch on later. Um, but yeah, very fascinating to me that some things like that need so much time for people to come up with uh, with solutions. Yeah, there is the term Allumwandlung, which is derived from German. It sort of means to promote to any piece possible, something like that. I would uh, would define it. I don't know what Wikipedia says. Is a chess problem theme where the same uh, pawn is promoted variously to a queen, rook, bishop, and knight. Yeah. That's kind of what I meant. So possible solutions. Um, the first person who came up with uh, with a possible solution was 1912, Wolfgang Pauli. Um, <clears throat> but it wasn't entirely correct. Because here we have the first example. White plays b3. And then after black's promotion to a1, if, white, if black takes a queen, then white promotes to a queen on f8 and he wins the game. The same happens with the rook and the knight, but it doesn't work with the bishop. So the problem was not entirely correct in the end. After the years that followed, there have been many attempts, um, but most of them failed due to aesthetic reasons, as I understood it from the article. You see there's sort of an aesthetical etiquette in chess um, composition, which, for example, in this example, um, can be seen quite nicely why, why it's not um, supported by chess etiquette, chess problem etiquette, because simply there are too many uh, rooks, for example. There are three rooks, which doesn't seem natural, and four bishops, which also doesn't seem natural. So that's kind of how I, I understood it. But then came Leonid Yarosh, a Soviet um, football coach, actually, as it says here, and he was completely unknown until he published one of his solutions to the problem. But here, um, in, in the first edition by him, uh, it was also disregarded due to aesthetical reasons, because the first move for white, which is rook takes h4, is a capture move, and this in chess, in chess composition is not highly regarded, because it's not, it's not aesthetical. Um, otherwise, the problem was correct, if I read it correctly. Um, by the way, also many people have said along the lines that the problem is simply not solvable. Like there was one 
person. I think it was Drumar uh, who just said, he, he gave up and said, it's, it's not solvable. Here, here he said, Drumar gave up saying that the Babson task would never be uh, satisfactorily solved. Um, but Leonid Jarosz did not give up and then at the end he came up with this solution, which as I understood it is completely correct also due to aesthetical reasons, um, but it was a made in four problem. And now you will ask why is the title then called it was solved in 2025? That's because now a person uh, actually composed a study. By the way, on a side note, I found it um, incredibly amusing uh, to see what the Dutch author Tim Krabbe um, wrote because uh, he was also looking at this problem and then he, he said, he records that the realization that somebody had at last solved the Babson task had the effect upon him as if, if he had opened the newspaper and seen the headline, Purpose of Life Discovered. So again, we kind of see this uh, scheme of people believing that it's not, not solvable. But then we come to uh, the final problem, which is then kind of the main thing about this video, which is the solution by Daniele Guglielmo Gatti. Please, sorry for the uh, pronunciation to my Italian friends. Uh, but he was able to come up with, with an actual study. So the title is White Wins and it follows the Babson task with the promotion. And uh, yeah, from now on, we're gonna go to the article, which actually gave me the idea to, to ma make this video. So we're gonna jump there from Wikipedia. So this is the uh, before mentioned article and it is written, uh, just to give some background information about this chess column, it's written by Michael Ehn, um, who is uh, this part of, uh, of the collaboration, who actually owns a chess store in, in Vienna. So if you're in Vienna anytime, it's one of the last remaining chess stores in, in whole Europe, I think. And um, I've known him for a long time and always like to uh, go to his store. So in case you're in Vienna and you want to check out like a very old and historic um, chess store, then please check out his, tour, his store. He's also a fascinating person who knows so much about chess history in general and, and, uh, and history in general. So yeah, that's just on a side note. And the other person is, I think his name is Ernst Struhal, who is an, an Austrian historian. So they always write this article together and it's always very interesting touching onto some historical chess topics in general. So we're gonna go through that. Uh, I know it's in German, but I just briefly wanna discuss the main things about, um, uh, which was written some of the things we already saw in the Wikipedia article, uh, but some of, some of the things are also mentionable. So um, he starts off by saying that, that this problem is comparable to problems in math in, as well. For example, the Fermat math problem um, or the Poincaré um, math problem, which also took a long time to solve. Uh, one was solved by the legendary uh, Grigory Perelman, who I watched a video about him some time ago. He's a genius math, um, genius mathematician from, from Russia. And he was able to solve this kind of unsolvable problem. And uh, then he was even offered $1 million kind of by some um, institution as a reward for solving that. And he declined the, the price, simply stating that he's not interested in money or fame. And uh, yeah, just a very fascinating uh, person in general. Um, and then he comes to the so-called Himalaya of the chess composition, which he is referring to the Babson task. So that was kind of a nice rhetoric uh, way to, um, to introduce the, this problem. So some historic facts, which we already went uh, through, also explaining it, but we're really gonna grasp the concept once we're, once we're going to the solution, um, then everything becomes very much clear. Uh, Babson, yeah, he did not, of course, manage to um, solve the problem during his lifetime. Uh, he was born in, in the 19th century, so he didn't make it to, to 2025 to, to see the final solution, unfortunately. Yeah, he also, uh, the authors also mentioned Leonid Jaros, who came up with a problem uh, with, with a mate problem. But as I said before, no one could, um, no one could compose a study with the Babson task yet. And now he goes to the, to the actual study, which we're going to have a look at on the board. Before that, uh, I want to point out what they are saying in the last sentence. Um, take like they are asking from the reader to take one week um, off of work and study this um, day and night to fully understand and appreciate the, um, the beauty of, of the composition. So let's do that now. So now we come to the final solution of the problem proposed uh, by Daniele Gatti. 
uh, to the Babson task. So now we have the problem in front of us and I'm already correcting myself, it's not a problem, it's a study. That's what it's all about. It's a study and the exercise is, um, is white to win, even though um, what I didn't understand from the article was what was white's last move. Maybe I missed it, um, but this one is actually with, with black to start, but white anyway wins. And uh, kind of the, the main question is if black promotes. So the position in general is very complicated. It's um, quite obvious that it's not driven from a real game, um, from a practical game. Uh, so we're just going to go through the possible variations and uh, just to explain kind of what it's all about. So let's start with, uh, I wouldn't even call it the most obvious move for black, but according to my variations it is, uh, which is F1 queen. And now the whole... Uh, we get to understand everything and the best variation or the only win for white is to take on g8 and to promote to a queen. So now the threat is knight f7 with checkmate and if knight e5 check, d takes e5, queen f4 check, now there's another brilliant idea for white which is knight e4. Uh, the main thing is if white takes here then queen takes b5, also the same applies to queen c3. Um, if white takes the queen then it's quite a pretty stalemate, to be honest. Queen b5 um, has the same same effect. If black takes, there is also stalemate. So that's why after queen f4 uh, checked, the only solution is knight e4 to actually win the game. And if queen takes e3, rook h1, take everything, and now it's going to be checkmate. So that's all if black uh, promotes to a queen. And if it promotes to a bishop, then we also need to promote to a bishop. Uh, why? In this case, um, I'm mostly going through the variations if why it promotes to a queen, because it's otherwise the most obvious choice. Um, now it doesn't work because after knight e5 check, d takes e5, queen c3 uh, will be followed by a stalemate. So that's why the queen uh, is the wrong piece in this situation to promote to. Um, but after f1 bishop, of course, white also needs to, do, to make a bishop. And now uh, the same variations don't work anymore uh, because there is no stalemate, because the king can always go to g7 or to g6. Uh, so my variation continues after h takes g8 bishop, king g7, and now c6. Again, it's all quite irrational from a human point of view, but in the end, um, yeah, it turns out that white is winning here. c8 queen check, and even though black is threatening to promote e1 queen, uh, I think there was more or less checkmate in time. Um, yeah, just too many attackers. And here I stop my analysis because white is up. Well, it's not even so obvious what he's up because black has those two light squared bishops uh, on the first rank, but he's up in exchange, but black's king is very weak. So I checked all of this with the computer. Of course, um, um, Mr. Gatti uh, had the, the correct correct solution, of course. So f1 uh, bishop is followed by h takes g8 bishop. Um, f1 rook is, you can guess which, which piece are we going to promote to. h takes g8 rook, of course. Again, why doesn't um, doesn't the queen work? Again, because of the same stalemate trick in this case with rook f4 check. And if knight e4, now again the same uh, same idea, or also queen c3 is a draw. Uh, so in this case, h takes g8 rook is the only solution. And um, again, now all of this doesn't work if if knight e5 check, d takes e5, and rook f4. Uh, now white has knight e4. The the main reason is that black can always go to king h can go to h7. Uh, that's the main difference. Um, if if we go back to that variation with the queen here, then the king cannot go to h7. Um, so we take a rook, um, and the variation con continues. Rook g1, knight d6. Uh, again, I'm just going to go through that. e d6, knight e4, check, and checkmate in the end. So that's if black takes a rook. Now let's see what happens if black takes a knight. Um, you can guess what uh, piece is white going to promote to. Correct, of course, a knight. Uh, has to for the problem to be correct. Uh, what does happen if uh, white takes a queen? In this case, it's sort of obvious because knight takes e3 is checkmate. So white needs to promote to a knight, king g7, knight e6, check, king takes g8, and rook e2, and it turns out in the end simply white is too much material up, and this pawn on c5 is also quite, um, quite strong in the end. This was how my variation went, and this pawn will most likely promote to a queen, and white is winning. So that's sort of the solution to the problem. Uh, again, I think this is absolutely amazing. Uh, I hope there will be more tasks like this in the future. Uh, I hope you also enjoyed this video. Uh, it was something more uh, different this time, but I'm very much into chess history and history in general, and also chess composition. 
So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, it really helps out the, the channel itself. You can also visit my, my website, felixbroberger.com. And otherwise, I'll see you guys soon.